All right, guys, thanks for joining us on another edition of the Jacques Talk podcast. It's a pleasure right now for me to be speaking to somebody who I haven't spoken to in a long time. He played at LSU from 2009 through 2012, then had seven years in the NFL, Eagles, Bucks, Panthers, and also the Giants. He could have played another year, but decided to retire. Uh, Russell Shepard. Russell, how you doing, man? Thank you. I appreciate you, my man. Appreciate you. First off, Russell, I hear it from a lot of people just congratulations on your NFL career. You were undrafted, right? It was a humbling experience, obviously, coming to LSU, being um, the guy I was with all the hype and the attention, you know, being the court, playing the quarterback position and then kind of transitioning into different other positions. So, um, you know, being able to kind of, you know, still have a career, you know, and uh, be able to build off of that after being an undrafted guy, definitely um, very rewarding feeling after, you know, I call it quits towards the end. Russell, I looked up your NFL stats. Uh, you caught 60 passes as a pro. You had six touchdowns in the league. But it looks like perhaps your biggest contribution was on special teams. You made 47 tackles in your career, 43 solo, four forced fumbles. How did a guy that was the number one uh, dual threat quarterback coming out of high school in the country transform his game into a special teams guy that was able to play in the league for seven years? Well, you know, I got to give Thomas McGahee some credit. You know, um, he was a guy that um, obviously coached me for, you know, a year or two at LSU. And um, he always told me, you know, Russell, you know, understand that you're probably not, you know, having the career or, you know, putting the numbers or, you know, getting the playing time that you want. You know, being that we had talented guys like a Odell Beckham, a Jarvis Landry, a Reuben Randall, even older guys like me, a Terrence Tolliver, a Brandon LaFell. You know, he always kind of, you know, Coach Mack just kind of always put in my mind that, you know, you have the skill set. You got the mind. You got the mindset in order to make it in the NFL. You just got to figure out what's your niche. How can you make it? And you know, obviously, my last year we were very talented. Like I said, you know, it was kind of the coming out party for you know Odell. Um, you know, Jarvis was uh, one of the the most talented guys in the country, and didn't even play too much his his freshman year. So, um, you know, I knew that if I wanted to, you know, start to you know kind of work on my second life you know, my professional life, I had to transition, I had to be a special team guy. So my last year at LSU, being able to get involved on the kickoff unit, being able to return a little bit, being able to be a gunner at times, it was, it was kind of my, you know, my welcoming to um, special teams. So once I got to NFL, you know, um, I wasn't like the other guys who were all Americans at receiver, or all American DB or all American this, you know, I was a guy who already played special teams. So the transition for me was, um, I feel, you know, quite, you know, I won't say easy, but it was a little easier for, for me. I, I know I heard from people when you pop up on ESPN catching a touchdown or making a play or as a year, Russell Shepard still playing? He's still in the NFL? He still, did you hear that? I hear from my dad, my dad all the time. You know, I was a my, you know, I came from being a quarterback to being this highly skilled or talented offensive weapon to being a special team guy. You know, a lot of times I was a number 53 guy on the roster, you know, um, and like I say, coaches just fell in love with me, not because of my physical skill set, but just because of my competitive nature, you know, my, my, my leadership ability and just my, my will to just want to win, you know, coming from LSU, going through a Tommy Moffitt, you know, offseason, you know, going through a, a Les Miles just, you know, structure, his, his blueprint. You know, we were competitive. We wanted to win by any means, and whether it was catching the ball, blocking, or doing what I had to do and um, tackling people. So, like I said, you know, I, I didn't tackle so many people at LSU. So, like I said, <laughs> me having to learn how to tackle people on the fly and, um, you know, build a career uh, out of it, um, that was um, one of the, the – probably, I would say, one of the uniquest, interesting journeys um, I had to go through, you know, going from being a quarterback. Russell, you think that maybe if you would have been a top 10 pick, top five pick, and had all those guaranteed millions and all that, that is, you, you have to fight against, um, you know, being complacent maybe or, or something like that. It seems like the position you were in, you were always starving, right? You were always hungry to stay in the fight, right? Definitely. It was definitely, you know, being a, a high draft pick, being a guy that's a, that comes into this new norm with, um, a, a new source of income, a lot of a lot of money. You know, it can be a very you know um, a shocking thing. It happens it shocks a lot of young men. You know, it shocks their families. It, it's 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 a whole different ball game. So you're right. You know, me being able to come in the league, 
my first check was forty five hundred dollars before taxes, you know, and, um, you know, like I said, I had to kind of make it the hard way. It definitely showed me um, it, it kind of gave me a, a, a gratitude towards, you know, everything that I was able to to receive, you know, financially from the NFL and even also to just being able to be in the locker rooms, being able to, you know, take advantage of the relationships. You know, whether it was an owner, it was a GM, it was an older guy on the team that had a successful career, was doing some great things off the field. I was just trying to sponge it all up. You know, um, like I said, um, if I was a top 10 pick, if I was just like the five star recruit Russell Shepard and I was the top three pick and all, you know, I, I wouldn't have the same mindset. You know, I think I still would have been a pretty firm and solid individual. I come from a great family, got some great morals and things and it's a foundation. But at the same time, it's definitely a double-edged sword when you're coming into um, something like this where you don't have really experience from the financial standpoint. When you look back coming out of high school, Russell, you're a five-star guy and I don't know, you're 17, 18 years old and all this national attention and everything. Now being 30, going on 31 years old and you look back on that, is it, are we putting too much pressure on kids and is that, the whole recruiting thing and what's expected and the five star and all that. How do you look back on that? Well, you know, definitely I'm, I'm grateful. I was kind of, you know, I'm kind of before the social media era because obviously it's a lot for, for, for any young man or young woman to, to deal with everything that goes with being a five star, being a highly recruited guy, high recruited gal, you know, whatever sport you're playing. So you're right. It's a lot, you know, um, you know, I, I I, I won't say it's too much, you know, um, because, you know, as much as given, much is required, you know, and this is a big, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big game. It's a lot that goes into it, um, whether it's high school, whether it's collegiate, whether it's the NFL, there's billions of dollars being poured into these sports. And, um, you know, um, like I said, they're going to, they're going to pump them up. They're going to make the stadiums bigger. They're going to make the TV contracts bigger. More people are going to be in the stand. So I think it just kind of comes with it. I think as, as, as mentors, mentors being guys like myself um coaches you know parents i think you know the the, the better we learn how to help our, our youth through these things and be able to you know kind of keep them focused i think that's where you know uh, we as you know the elders as the older people have to kind of look to turn to help them but i'm, I'm not going to be the old guy and say it's too much because i loved it as a kid i embraced it i, I love the attention i love playing on the national stage as a as a, as a high school kid and, um, you know, I love that as a, as a collegian. I love that as a, as a man, as a pro. So, you know, I just think we just got to continue to keep helping these kids because they're still kids. And um, we just got to protect them from themselves in certain situations. Russell, your time at LSU, the struggles of the offensive era, and did they utilize that guy to the best of his ability? Did they maximize his ability? And you were always a, a topic when it came to that. I remember your freshman year, I looked it up, you had a 70-yard touchdown run against Auburn as a freshman, right? So this guy should be having a huge career on offense, right? And so how, how do you look back on that, uh, your, your career at LSU? You know, it was just kind of the style of, st style of ball we played. You know, um, Coach Miles was a ground and pound guy. You knew if you were going to, you know, commit and, and play on that team and be a receiver, you're going to have to first be able to block. You're going to have to be able to, you know, help establish the run. You know, we took pride in beating people physically. And, I, you know, obviously, you know, it was a, you know, it, even being in the, in, the, in the NFL, you know, the best way to beat somebody is just running down, you know, running down the throat, running straight at them. And um, like I say, it, it was a bruising way and it was a way, you know, it was a way why we intimidate people. But um, obviously being a receiver, being a guy that's seeing other receivers throughout the country, how they're being utilized and, and things of that nature. We always kind of say, you know, what if? What if we spread it out? What if we went four wide, five wide? You know, what if we just slung it? You know, um, you know, Jordan had a Jordan as well as Jared Lee and, and Zach Minberg. They all had the ability to throw it. So, um, like I said, it was always kind of in the back of our mind, but, you know, being who we were, knowing the, the, the culture that was at LSU, you know, um, the most important thing for any LSU receiver is to just, you know, help establish the run. Yeah, and during your career at LSU, not too shabby, 43 wins, only 10 losses, and a top 10 team at the end of 2010 that won big in the Cotton Bowl, and then the 2011 team. Uh, Russell, I've told many people, if we're going to talk about greatest LSU teams of all time, I will bring up the 2011 team. There are four national champions in LSU's history, and I would have to say that the 2011 team, at the very least, is perhaps the best team in LSU history that did not win a title. How do you look back on, on 2011? Hundred percent. You know, um, it's kind of bittersweet being in New Orleans. Um, you know, with the year before the COVID, 
I believe it was 2020 when we won the national championship with um, Joe and Justin Jefferson and, you know, the other guys. But, um, you know, it hurts. You know, obviously, you know, being able to um, go back to New Orleans and win it, um, it was always a feeling that we always wanted. You know, that 2011 class was a special, um, it was a special group of guys, you know, um, for us to win how we won and, and beat the type of teams we played. You know, um, it, it was a – it was a season that we wanted to cap off with the um, with the national championship, but unfortunately we weren't weren't able to do that. But you know everything comes full circle. You know, like I said, to see these guys come back and win in New Orleans in a special way, and seeing people like Justin Jefferson, who I've been knowing since he's you know been 10, 11 years old. Um, you know, seeing somebody like Joe, you know, who come from another school, the Midwest, and kind of be embraced and loved, but you know, with the LSU culture. You know, like I said, it, you know, bittersweet for us, but really happy for, you know, those guys. Jarvis did tell me, I interviewed Jarvis on the field after the game that night. He did say there was some healing that took place with him, at least that night, in that building and remembering what happened and all that. 100%. It definitely did. You know, like I said, last time, you know, um, my last time being, in, you know, in that stadium, well, I want to say in that stadium, being in that stadium as a, as a college guy in the college atmosphere, you know, seeing the purple and gold everywhere, you know, obviously we lost and it was a big, big loss. But every time I came back to that stadium, even from an NFL, you know, perspective, you know, playing the Saints, I mean, um, you know, it's kind of always, you're going to remember, you're going to remember that, that, that game, you're going to remember that loss. But again, it's a part of football. It's, it, it's what kind of what happens and, you know, it creates, you know, um, it creates great stories and just great memories. What about all the guys on that team, uh, Russell, that year? You know, Tyron Matthew, he's a finalist for the Heisman Trophy. All the guys that went pro, Michael Brockers, I mean, on down the line, just a loaded team. Definitely, definitely. You know, it was a, a very talented team. You know, um, when I got to the NFL, even at, as being an undrafted free agent, you know, you can tell that I played with a certain class of talent, you know, a certain class of athlete, guys who like to compete, who love to compete. Because, um, you know, all those guys went on to have successful careers from Eric Reed to a Tyron Matthew to a Michael Brockers, you know, Barcavius Mingo, you know, Ruben Randall, Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, you know, Benny Logan. I, I can keep naming, but I'm going to stop, you know. But <laughs> obviously, um, you know, that 2009, 2008 2010 class, you know, on those three classes, even if you throw in a little bit of the 11 guys, very talented group of guys. And um, like I said, um, every team I played on, you know, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, they always had jokes. GMs always had jokes that if they want a ball player, they go to the, you know, the, the dirty South to Baton Rouge and then they come and get one. So like I said, it was a very, it was an honor to play with those type of guys. And even watching those guys transition to their second phases of, in life and um, being able to, you know, sustain, you know, great careers. Some of them are going to be Hall of Famers. It definitely shows you the type of talent we were playing with. Russell, how many times during 2019 did you call somebody, you text somebody, man, I wish I could play in this offense. I wish I could have played in the Joe Brady offense. Oh, man, I talked to Jordan Jefferson probably every day that, that season. You know, um, I still remain close friends with a lot of those guys and um, be able to, you know, it's kind of like I, like Jarvis said, you know, be able to, you know, just kind of some some wounds were healed, you know, to be able to to watch these guys, you know, throw the ball 60 times a game to watch these guys, you know, to, to go out and win in a different type of way. Um, to watch these guys just kind of win it when we didn't win it, in, you know, in New Orleans, the, the, the natty, the most important game. You know, like I said, we talked a lot. You know, that, that season, those group of guys, they brought up a lot of great conversations with the old guys, you know, and um, like I said, I, I think that was one of the, you know, um, you know, one of the funner seasons I've never been a part of, if that makes sense. When you came to LSU, were you thinking that you had a chance to play quarterback? With, with me, it was always, you know, um, I wanted to go somewhere where I had an opportunity to at least try it. You know, I always knew it was a possibility I can play another position. You know, when I got to LSU, I got I kind of got close to Jordan Jefferson, ironically, out of everybody. And I'm watching his talent, you know, watching just kind of the, the control, the grasp he had over the team at that point in time. You know, knowing my skill set, knowing why I kind of trans, you know, why I kind of transitioned to the next level as, you know, even as a, as a freshman, I seen that I probably, you know, have a better chance as a skill guy. You know, whether it was receiver position or playing defensive back or even running back like I did you know, a good bit of my LSU career, LSU career. There was some humor to it because it'd be a chat room discussion or a phone call on a post-game show. Is Russell Shepard going to throw a pass this week? This is the week Russell Shepard throws a pass. You never threw a pass in your LSU career, correct? 
Not one, not one. And, you know, we had things, you know, drew up. You know, we had plays. You know, Coach Miles was really big on preparation. So we we went through everything. Obviously, um, teams knew my scout report. They knew my background. So when we play Alabama, you know, you can hear, you know, Mark Barham. You can hear Drake or Patrick saying, watch him. He can throw. Watch him. He can throw. You know, even when I got to the NFL, you know, I spent a little time uh, my, my, my rookie year with, um, with Greg Schiano. You know, his, his staff had a little wildcat package for me. So, like I said, you know, it definitely, um, it, it kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing knowing who I was in college, in high school. And for me to never throw a pass, not one in my college career, um, it's definitely a head scratcher. But at the same time, um, I, you know, I'm the first to say that, you know, you know I, I wasn't Tom Brady. <laughs> and Russell, while there's some negative aspects to social media, some people just go in there to be negative because they're just angry or whatever. But I think one of the beautiful things about it is I, I love seeing, you know, you maybe interact with uh, Odell Beckham or whoever when you guys are kind of who you, you played with and with the Giants, how you guys kind of interact and share some love. You know, uh, when somebody wins a Super Bowl like Fournette and, and the former LSU guys congratulate him, Devin White on down the line. I think it's always cool to see the, the, the brethren, the fraternity, so to speak, of LSU football, the way they support one another. 100%. I would say it's probably one of the, the – the 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 most tight click gang gang i mean brotherhoods you're gonna get in the nfl like i say every gym knows when you draft the lsu guy when you sign the lsu guy you're getting a competitive you're getting a, a a leader you're getting somebody that's all the way in you know um like i said it's it's you know going through that that culture going through the, you know what i'm saying those those training sessions going through just that that whole experience with those guys man you're right it, it, it bring it just kind of brings us so close together and it kind of just you know an lsu guy when you see one devin white i didn't play with him but you know he's an lsu guy that that <laughs> that, 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 that fire that run that running from sideline to sideline that talking trash every play you know that competitive nature I mean, I know why Jason like, you know, he drafted him. I mean, he got exactly what he wanted. I mean, that's why Kevin Min is there. You know, that's why, you know, all these other guys, you know, Leonard Fournette, you know, that's why they signed him. You know, I mean, like I said, the list goes on, but I said, you're definitely right. It's a special place. Awesome. A couple more things before I let you go here. Um, so you were in Tampa. And so Drew Brees, finally, we've, we've shed our tears. He's retired. So Jameis Winston, it certainly looks like he's going to get a shot to at least be the starting quarterback in New Orleans. I just wanted your thoughts on being around Jameis, and he's still young. I mean, he's 27, 28 years old, whatever. He could have really a second career here if he uh, maximizes this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Jameis was one of the um, – Jameis is the hardest working, um, you know, probably team I've, I've ever had. You know, a lot of people don't understand the things that he puts in on and off the field. You know, um, you know, they kind of get lost in all the other things that happen, you know, when you're a celebrity or somebody of his notoriety. You know, you do one little thing. Some people forget about all the other little things. But I'm the first to say that Jameis was the hardest working teammate I've had. Um, I played with some talented guys. I've been with some great leaders. And Jameis was the first one in. He, Jameis was a coach on the field. You know, he was a sponge. He was he was very humble enough to, you know, always seeking guidance, whether it was a Josh McCown or whether it was a Drew Brees or Tom Brady. He constantly was seeking, you know, just more. He wanted more, not just from a physical standpoint, but he wanted more mentally. So, like I said, you know, when you see guys like this get a, a second opportunity to um, get what you believe, what I believe he deserves. And that's a fair shot to be the quarterback in a, a city that I think will embrace him, a city that I think he really fits well, you know. In New Orleans, is all you all in, or you or or you're not. And Jameis is all in. That's the only way he knows. So I'm excited to see what comes out of that. Even if he's not the starter, having a person like that on your roster, in your locker rooms, in your community, I think you know it makes the team, the organization better. You know, as a whole. Wow, well said. So not to turn this into like an after-school special, Russell, for the kids, but I wanted to you. You're a great example. Okay, so you had a nice run in the NFL. But you're still only 30 years old, right? God willing, you could be on this earth another 70 years, and you got your, the rest of your life in front of you. And I would imagine that while you were playing football, at least you had some things in the back of your head that you were working on, like this new company you're starting. So tell people what you're doing now. And, and uh, I apologize for the corny parallel, but you did a lot of dirty work in the NFL, right? And now, and now your business, you're doing some dirty work. 
Right, right, right. So, you know, uh, my family, going back to my family, we have a little history with dump trucks transporting simple things like sand, dirt, gravel, just the simple things. You know, uh, like I said, my family has done that for decades. So I was growing up, you know, before I played football, I was in the back of dump trucks, you know, and playing with dirt and just watch my family just kind of sustain and maintain off of something like that. Something as simple as that. So once I got to the NFL and obviously, you know, being an undrafted guy, seeing guys on and off the roster every year, um, one year I was on Tampa Bay. It was our 2014 season. I think we had over 300 guys come in and off that team that year. So, you know, obviously being on teams that wasn't really winning early on and seeing the turnover at a high level, you know, it was always on my mind to, you know, be more, you know, have another, have a, have a plan, you know, not a backup plan, have a plan, you know, and be ready for, you know, when it's, it's, it's over. So, you know, I had a little experience my first year. I started my own dump trucking company. It went really well. You know, it was a great opportunity for me to get a little, you know, business experience, learn how to juggle both being an athlete and being more than an athlete, you know, adding things to myself, different layers. And um, I had success with that. You know, after having that from 2013 to 2015, um, I actually ended up selling it. And then my mom and dad kept a portion of it and they maintained it to this day. And um, it was a great uh, it was a great learning experience for me. in this aspect is that. When you're in the NFL and you come across this money and this opportunities to progress and push your people forward, you know, the, the best thing you can do is not give them money is to create opportunity and create opportunity through jobs, through building companies, through, through um, you know, pushing people through um, college education, you know, adding things to your, your people. So with me, I had, I seen that, I seen the importance of, you know, giving, helping my mom and them sustain, build their own company. And it, it kind of took the pressure off me to always figure out how I'm going to provide for my family. So, you know, after that, you know, I seen that my family did that. Um, you know, I kind of went into the trash business. I, I knew that they were making, you know, great money. I knew that there wasn't a lot of minority owned trash companies, waste companies. And um, I just kind of went for it. So, you know, I planned on opening this, open my um, my company, my now company, Shep Boys Waste Management, after the 2020 COVID season. But when COVID hit, you know, I didn't know if the world was going to end. Nobody didn't know what was going on. So I decided to launch my company. And, um, you know, we've been open now for eight months. We opened August of August 3rd of 2020. And we've been open, like I said, a little bit over eight months and uh, we're doing really well, man. We're a, we're a wastewater company. We transport particularly human waste and uh, wastewaters of all, all sorts, whether it's grease, septic tank, and also too, we're rental providers of portable toilets, hand wash stations, and holding tanks. So we're a glorified portable toilet company to say the least. And uh, we do a lot, of, a lot of different things and uh, we, we're doing some great things. We're the fastest growing waste management um, company in the city of Houston, the waste, start, waste startup. And um, we have um, some big plans, man, to bring in some old LSU guys and, and build a, a minority-owned waste management company on a um, minimum regional level, going from Houston to, you know, the southeast Florida. You made the point to mention minority-owned a couple of times here. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get too serious with you, but I just thought I'd give you the opportunity. What, what do you think people learned and what did we learn in the last uh, 12 months about race relations, racial tensions, those kind of things, do you think? Um, it's real, you know, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Latino, you know, you're Asian American, you know, it's real, you know, unfortunately, you know, some of these things um, play out and uh, we don't even know that we're, we do them, you know, it's just so ingrained into the, you know, society, you know, our, our education systems, you know, just our social climate. So sometimes people don't know, but um, I will say, you know, after my experience being a professional athlete for almost a decade, you know, going to a great school like LSU, being a minority, I will say, um, or being a professional athlete, um, the best way to drive and to, to drive yourself and your family forward and push through all those things that plagued us for so many years is ownership, you know, starting companies, um, gaining ownership in companies, whether it's buying stock, um, you know, creating opportunities, you know, that that's what I've seen, you know, and through my company, you know, we're able, we, like I said, we're able to employ, you know, young men and young women who've had, you know, trouble backgrounds, who have, you know, um, you know, arrest histories, and uh, we're able to give them a second start. And um, like I said, that's where I think, you know, being an athlete, um, being a, a, a athlete that came across, you know, a great, you know, opportunity to make some money, to do some great things. I think being able to take advantage of the opportunity and, and build businesses and create opportunity for your family and things like that, that's how you push forward because you're right. All these things are real. The racial tension is real. You know, um, the, the social, you know, standards, 
you know, like I said, you can be a poor white kid and not be treated like a, a rich white kid. So sometimes it's, it doesn't have even anything to do with race. It's just the, the climate and just the way this 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 country at times was, was, was kind of created. Well, very well said, man. And certainly living in the city of Houston, is that the fourth biggest city in the country? I mean, it's a huge place. <laughs> You're not going to run out of business. <laughs> You got people are pooping and peeing every day. I have my mentor. My mentor is John Farley. He owns one of the biggest national um, brokerage waste companies in the country. You know, um, he does really well. Um, but it, he was that was, that was his, his line that sold me and got me into it. He said, Russell, people are, are pooping and peeing every day. So uh, when he told me that, I, I didn't see nothing nasty. I just seen dollar signs. So, yeah, yeah, I told the NFL, thank you, but I'm gone. I know LSU fans, uh, they're thankful for your contributions to the Purple and Gold. They were very happy for you in your long NFL career, and hopefully they support your, uh, your new business endeavors as well. And it was great talking to you today. I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you. You have a good one now.